Brent Pope, well, I'm delighted you could get time to speak to us because you were getting full left, right and centre there <laughs> by nearly half the Aviva Stadium here. Yeah, well, it's good You're to see a popular I was man still. a few fans still at, uh, at my age and haven't been off the TV for a few years. So, yeah, that was a, a good part of the night. Absolutely. Well, listen, I think they got more entertainment out of you than they did out of the match behind us yeah, uh, credit, over the last full, 80 minutes or so. Full credit to the crowd that they didn't start a Mexican wave. And I think Caelan <laughs> Doris even said that they really gave them an injection there before Bundiaki scored because they needed it because you know let's face it it wasn't a particularly good game from either side um, you couldn't even call it an arm wrestle I mean we had that with South Africa it was such a tense game that day all the big physical hits this was a game of a different sort too many mistakes there was no fluid the ref didn't help I'd have to say he was quite pedantic about letting the game flow and neither side really got the advantage I mean Australia probably had the uh, the possession territory in the first half but you know at half time, 0 3 down. Second half, Ireland probably owned it, but then again, they left a few tries begging. So, look, you know, it wasn't a great game, but I mean, great teams, I say, always irk out those wins when they need to. And I mean, you know, you've got to look at Ireland's progression from beating New Zealand, beating South Africa, now beating Australia, all in the one year, number one ranked side in the, in the world going into Christmas. So, you know, it's a pretty good locker to have. We might just go back to the start of the game, and of course there was that late change. Johnny Sexton yep. ruled out through injury. What was your thoughts on the out half selection? Of course, Ross Byrne left on the bench. Jack Crowley given the nod to start his first international start, and of course then Peter O'Mahony was made captain. What was your thoughts on all of that jiggery pokery before the start of the game? Well, it must have been very difficult for a player of uh, uh, Jack Crowley's youth to come in at the very last moment, and also to replace kind of one of the talisman of, of, of Irish rugby and their kind of spiritual leader as well. So that must have been very hard for him because it's the last minute. You know, he can't have prepared for the last 24 hours. Maybe he knew close to the thing but it was a late it was a late change I said then Ross Burden came in and and uh, kicked the winning kick and he hasn't had uh, you know he's had a tough run of it through injuries and everything and appearances but I thought Jack Crowley played pretty well um, obviously he's got to get experience and this is how the games these types of games players learn from uh, but I liked his attitude I think for the very first uh, about five minutes he went up there and demanded the ball back from the Aussies which is quite a hard thing to do but it showed to me that he had confidence and that's what you need from an out half. He's only young, he's only learning but I thought he came through the game pretty well. thought Ross Byrne came on and you know it was a high pressure kick and he you know he's such a good kicker for Leinster over the years and for Ireland on occasion when he played for them and he nailed it at an important time of the match. They were a bit lucky I suppose to get away with the win in the end because Australia were camped on their line and when they had players like Bill, uh, Will Skelton come on, 130, 140 kgs, a lot of beef close to the line but I think at the end of the day Ireland probably deserved it in the, in the manner that they dug out that last minute mall uh, and uh, yeah they probably in the second half performance they probably just swayed it but only just. Ireland started off very brightly in fact the first 15 minutes looked pretty good there there was a good link up we saw early on between Jimmy O'Brien and, and Mac Hansen on the right hand side and it looked like oh this could be a good game for Ireland especially with Australia being so hot and cold this year more cold really than hot but then as the half yeah. wore on Australia just seemed to get better and better without really penetrating without really how did that go so wrong for Ireland do you think I just think you know it's 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 the one flaw that Ireland that had because you couldn't really apart from Caelan Doris and Mac Hansen and a few other sorties so to speak you know it seemed to be a malaise went right through the whole side I mean you know how long has it been since we haven't been able to list off a number of outstanding players I mean when did you see Josh Vanderfleer's name hardly mentioned in a game for the last couple of years I mean, it just seemed to be that one side and lost the momentum and, and the ref didn't help, but I'm not blaming him. They lost the momentum by their own mistakes, you know, drop balls at times, not fielding high kicks. You know, the number of, the number of drop passes we saw in the second half, the number of elementary mistakes, that'll be what will frustrate the coaching staff. It won't be that they'll win because they, you know, in a sense, great teams find a way to win. That'll please them, but won't... won't won't please them as the last two weeks play because they don't have a time to get it. I think I was telling you off because the most frustrating thing for a coach will be that he can't put it right for next week. Mm. Andy Farrow would have wanted a match next week to say, hey, let's get this out of our system and let's put it right. He's got to wait now. Players will go back to their provinces, then he'll bring them back in after Christmas. And that's a period of waiting for mm. them to put it right again. And so 
you know, it's not the perfect dress rehearsal for the Six Nations, but it's also maybe the perfect time to get a bit of a wake-up call and say, going into a World Cup and losing a player like Johnny Sexton, which you could do at the last moment, uh, you know, other players need to step up and other players need to lead the team around the field like Johnny Sexton does. And people say, look, it's not just about one man's game, but you really saw the kind of leadership that Johnny Sexton brings to a game in the way that he can sort of manage situations and say, look, this is what we're doing on Field of Park. And that's not up to Jack Crowley at that age. Mm. You know, that's up to the other players to, to, to do that. But it was just a frustrating game. Just two mistakes didn't allow the game to flow. Yeah, and as you said, a lot of errors, a lot of penalties conceded as well. But all that aside, the defending in that first half to keep Australia will be something maybe Andy Farrell will be thankful for. And I suppose we should be praising Simon Easterby as well. Yeah, well, of course, Andy Farrell, when he first came in under Joe Schmidt's kind of uh, reign, he was in there as a defence coach. I mean, Ireland's defence has been magnificent this whole year. You know, out in New Zealand, I was at those three games where they defended their line so well. We even saw against South Africa, you know, 20 or 30 minutes having to defend, and we saw it in the, in the, in the first half against Australia when they were camped on the line. And at one stage, I think I turned to you and said, look, Australia can have all the ball they want, but they're not going to get through. I mean, they were a pass away a couple of times, but you never had a feeling that Australia were going to get over in the first half, even though they had all the territory, all the possession. So Ireland's defence was good, but their attack wasn't. I mean, they were guilty at times of running a cross field, looked like they had a lot of space, and the Aussies just, I suppose, countered them. You know, that could be to do with you, th you thought for all the world that, that Mac Hansen would score when they had that when they were down to 14 men and they had that scrum uh, there. We should have got the try and the in-pass to uh, Gibson Park, but the Australians just managed to come across field and knock them into touch. But So, yeah, look. And they've had a lot of time together training and like Mike Cat looks after the attack side of the game. They've had a good month together and a bit of time yeah, before. Yeah, look disjointed though. Yeah, so what's, what, is that something that's... Are you worried about that? Going into the Six Nations? Uh, not really. Look, I th I th you know, I always equate uh, rugby a bit to boxing. Like, every every boxer, every team has its kind of off games. And at what mm. I said before, you know, the great teams find a way to win. Yeah. And that's the promising thing about Irish rugby. I mean, you know, 15 years ago, or whatever, 20 years ago, you'd have, you'd have welcomed a win against Australia at any time. Mm. Now we're looking at a thing, we've, we've become a bit greedy in a sense. Yeah. For, for people come along expecting, people outside saying to me, oh, you know, Ireland will run away with this game. The bookies have got 14 points in, is it a good bet and all that? And I said, yeah, it is because Ireland have never found Australia easy. And I saw something in this Australian team, the performances have been hot and cold, as you said. One week against the All Blacks, they were great. The next week, they get beaten by 30 or 40 points. That's just the way Australian rugby has been the last couple of years. So Ireland are going to have their off days, but at least they won. I mean, a few years ago, if this had been a World Cup match, they could have been out of it. But they did enough to win. They got through it. They'll look back and they'll say, look, an unblemished season. You've beaten all the heavyweights. You're the number one set tied in the world. I mean, you take that. And, and move on from it. But it's just a bit of a wake-up call that next year in the Six Nations, and I know people don't want to talk about the World Cup, but they should be talking about the World Cup because that's the next thing on their agenda to win. They've won Grand Slams before. they won a Six, uh, a Six Nations plenty of times and Triple Crowns, all those things. What they want is a World Cup now. So it's all very well for the players and camps saying, oh, well, it's only one game at a time. Yes, it's one game at a time, but it needs to be preparation to what your gold medal is. And your gold medal is is competing in the World Cup because they're going to have a quarterfinal draw possibly against the All Blacks or against France. So we've got to look at these players now and say, OK, we can have an off day, but we can still win. So that's the important thing. Yes, I was a bit disappointed in the attack play today, but that hasn't been Ireland's problem up until now. So I just take it off as a one-off situation that they just couldn't get motoring. Yeah, you know, and of course players missing as well. That might and have you make mistakes, you know. Yeah. You may, a player's put in a position and he drops the ball or he misses a tackle. Frustration comes on. You saw Ty Furlong or whatever. I've never seen him so frustrated in a <laughs> Taking game. Taking the clearance kick. <laughs> the clearance kick <laughs> down the field. But you saw him on screen a lot of times, you know, frustrated. Players were getting frustrated. Yeah. And that had something to do with the flow of the game. It had to do something with both sides. I mean, there was mistakes on the Australian side as well, you know. But Because, I mean, either team could get... You know, we, did we see a couple of flowing movements in the game? That was about it. And it, and it, and it all just was stopped. It was too stop-start to, to be fluid. But again, you know, on the positives, you know, 
got another look at a few players, mm. you know, got experience of the likes of Jack Crowley, Ross Byrne came on and nailed the kick. You want those sort of pressure situations from an out half coming on. Bundy Arkey was back and scored a try and <laughs> sort of brought that sort of camaraderie back into the squad. A couple of forwards came on and, and did their job defending that mall. So they're the promising thing. The negative things are too many mistakes, too many penalties given away when discipline was at a crucial, the referee was going to ping both sides all day long. So better discipline, a few elementary mistakes that you can put right yeah. and a lack of attack. And that would be the negative. Fixable stuff. Fixable so, stuff, hopefully. Just, uh, we did speak off air, I mentioned to you as well about Andy Farrell talking during this month of Autumn Nation Series matches and he, he, he was keen to highlight the fact that fringe players or young players coming into this squad don't get assured easy you know they'll really have to fight their way in and they have to impress him quite a lot so when you look back over the last three games is there any player that comes out of this that might might not have been first choice or a match day 23 player that could be in the six nations well that's probably the slightly disappointing thing because i don't you know certain players have done really well up to this game i mean we talked about jimmy o'brien i was waxing lyrical about his cameo when he came on and played that magnificent match against South Africa to the man of born you would have said and then today he didn't have such a great game made a couple of mistakes that he wouldn't be uh, that wouldn't be customary for his game uh, McCluskey was another one that earned his opportunity to come in played so well in that 20 or 30 minutes against South Africa and then against Fiji and then probably didn't have the same game today but I mean I think that's a learning curve I think the thing that'll upset uh, Andy Farrell the most is about what he's talked about is that he wanted to see the squad develop each game. Mm. So he wanted to take it up another notch from South Africa. But in fact, if you look at the last two weeks, it's probably come down a couple of notches. Probably come down a couple of notches against Fiji, which was understandable because you were playing a lot of new players, but then it probably came down another notch to, to, tonight. This was probably Ireland's, despite the win, mm. it was probably, I think I'd be fair to say that it was probably Ireland's poorest performance you know in New Zealand and all those games the South African game the Fijian game in Australia yeah you'd have to say because the Fijian game didn't flow either but that was understandable given that it was players coming in for their first games or whatever and, and for a long time hadn't played together this was a bit of a different situation given that it was an Australian it was kind of a wounded Australian side coming off the back of a loss to Italy and yes we would have expected you know a, a, a bounce back from them which we which we got uh, but I think that Andy Farrell will be itching. It'll be an itch that he can't scratch for, for a couple of months. But, you know, he, he, he wouldn't be overly impressed with the performance. We spoke as well. Uh, I was talking to you about Johnny Sexton, who mentioned during this week about if you want to win a World Cup, and he said, you look at the great sides like New Zealand, yep. who won the World Cup, South Africa, it's all about the injury profile and keeping players fit. And that isn't always something that comes down to look it's about having a good strength and conditioning team, have good values and good philosophy around all that kind of stuff amongst the playing squad. And that's something you, you think is very yep. important. And you think maybe Ireland are very good at Ireland are very good at that. They've always been good at that. When they were brought kicking and screaming into the professional game so many years ago, the first things they did, they were the blueprint for success in a way because they micromanaged their players. So, you know, you had the likes of players coming back at that time it was I think Malcolm O'Kelly and Victor Costell and these players they brought them back from the UK where they were having too many games and they gave players rest at time over here and rehabilitation time and Johnny Sexton has been pretty well micromanaged the last couple of years even for the number of games he plays in a season and that might yet be a team like France's downfall because those players have to go back to their clubs that's where most of their wages are played so the club bosses don't really care in a sense about French rugby. I'm not saying they don't care about French rugby doing well, but they, they want their players back because they pay them. So they say, look, I want you back. I want Inter Mac back playing for Toulouse the week after he's had an international. Whereas, you know, Andy Farrell might talk to Lynch and say, look, I don't want Johnny Sexton playing this week. So give him a rest. So they've done that really well. And I know they have an excellent medical staff behind them and they have an excellent, I suppose, rehab centres and even these you know hospitals they go to get the operation on they're given the right time to recuperate and that, you're right that becomes vitally important the backroom staff become more important than a world cup year than ever before because you just saw today that if ireland which we all know lose a couple of crucial players next year in the six nations they're a lot different team 
Yeah. You know, but all teams are like that. You know, all teams are reliant on three or four players being fit so they can give a, a, a good like. You know, if you're picking your if you're picking your world 15 now, you have certain positions where all teams are uncertain of, and the centres and that. I was trying to name my team earlier, and I thought, like, what centres have really performed mm. overall from any union? I couldn't find really that have people that have performed all the week. So, what I'm saying is that there's few teams have two or three players that can step into every position. Mm. So, like. You know, New Zealand's even reliant on Richie Moanga staying fit or whatever, or Bowden Barrett staying fit. So we're not alone in that respect. But it is important if you're going to win a World Cup that you, it's won by a squad. And I think that was proved today that if this had been a World Cup, they would have taken that and said, we got out of a win, we got out of a group or something like that. It was a close run thing, but you move on. Uh, but look, you're right. Uh, I, think, I think we all know that, you know, Johnny Sexton is key. Yeah to Ireland the World Cup and he said let's call a spade a spade he is and I mean without Johnny Sexton's leadership uh, in managing players around the field and his kind of I suppose what he brings to the team he's vital to Irish rugby and he, and he needs to be kept in cotton wool now he'll want to play every game next year's Six Nations but I don't know that he should okay. really in a sense because I think we're still undecided about who the number two and three out halves going to the World Cup so you think yeah. if Fitch, Joey Carberry needs to play a meaningful yeah. game, shall we say, uh, in the yeah, Six Nations? Absolutely. And I think that was what Jack Crowley would have got out of today. He would have got about, this is a different level, and I've got to come in. And I think he performed Abenbury in that situation. That you know, It's the worst time to come in as replacing your kind of talisman and also coming in as he did maybe the night before the game or the, or the morning of the game. He's thrust into a game against Australia, one of the leading rugby nations you know, in history. And he's with that responsibility. So I don't think it was his responsibility to have it, had enough experience to say, this is what we should do, this is the cause, this is what we should do. No, because he's only been with the squad, what, a few few weeks or whatever. So like that. So that when you take away that responsibility that Johnny Sexton brings, Johnny Sexton brings experience. Mm. Forget about his play, you know, that's been that's been so youthful this year. It's his experience that counts. You know, to say in a situation, guys, let's just slow it down. Let's eliminate the mistakes. Let's put the ball in the corner for, for a while. Let's maul them. Let's do this. Let's go for goal. Whatever it is, that's what you miss is you miss the, you, the, the leadership. Now, certain forwards, you know, obviously, you know, they can come into it. But, but forwards don't necessarily, they just want to get on with their own game sometimes. Yeah, you know, yeah. they don't want to be bothered having meetings and deciding what the backs want to do. They just want to say, look, let's just go through a brick wall at this stage, you know. <laughs> so... Uh, so look, uh, you know, yes, we've learned a few things and that's good. And I think that, that there's still a balance out on a few players. I don't, I don't think any of these players have cemented their position, those fringe players, mm. just yet. Uh, you know, I think they've got to do a little bit more. And I think they'll be a bit sore about this game because I think you're right. I think this was a golden opportunity mm. to say, I'm going to back up a game against Fiji or a game against South Africa with another performance and I'm really going to put up their name so that, you know, who, who does he leave out rather than who does he put in? So I think he's, Andy Fowler, has probably a few decisions to make before the next Six Nations, but I think you're right. I think if Joey Carberry is going to be number two or is Jack Cowley going to be number two or is Ross Byrne going to be number two, then I think absolutely they need more meaningful, meaningful games mm. because if we get to a World Cup and Johnny Sexton is suddenly ruled out, then the player that's got to step in is going to have to step into games like this, you know, in a cauldron and, 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 and get a win. So just to finish then, Brent, uh, looking across the, the year as a whole, you know, winning a Test Series in New Zealand. Oh, fantastic. Historic, beating the world champions yep. uh, in the first Test match in November. Those two things are something that this Irish team will take to a World Cup. And I suppose it will, it, you know, it breaks down a lot of mental barriers for them maybe to have those kind of results in the bag. Whatever about Fiji and Australia, granted they were poor performances, as we said earlier, they're fixable problems. But having that in the bank there where you've beaten these big, big nations in rugby, the two greatest nations in rugby, um, and to have that going to World Cup will be massive. Well, it was always said to me, uh, you know, I, I'm going back to years, you know, when I was playing in New Zealand, but as I said before, winning becomes a habit. Yeah. And that's what you've got to get into. Momentum is huge in, in, in World Cups. And you even talk about England when they won their World Cup. They all talk about going out in that tour to New Zealand and Australia before the World Cup and winning out there. That was the monkey off the back. 
Ireland have taken that monkey off the back. They know they can go away to the, to the toughest place in the world to win a series, which was New Zealand. They can beat the world champions here. They can beat Australia. They can beat all these teams. Now they've just got to take that forward into a good Six Nations. I'm not saying they necessarily need to. I think they probably need to, to win or come pretty close to winning the Six Nations. And then take that all that momentum and all that experience and all those sort of monkeys off the back into a World Cup year. And, and I'm saying it for me, let's get to a semi-final or a final to win the World Cup because that has to be... The goal. Their aspirations. It has yeah. to be their goal. And, yeah. I, and I liken it to athletics. You know, you can win all the world titles all you like, or you can have the world records leading into an Olympic four year cycle, but it's the Olympic gold that every athlete wants, and they hold that treasure. So it's, an, it's a World Cup medal, is what Johnny Sexton wants the most to hang round his neck. And, you know, what a way to go out for, for players like that, you know, Omani and these guys that will come to the end of their career. That is what they want. They found a way to win a match. Tonight, I think that, you know, 10 years ago, they possibly wouldn't have won. So that's the good things. But, you know, plenty of work-ons, plenty of learnings, plenty of young players still with room to manoeuvre to get into that squad. So there's a lot to play for over the provincial season as well. And then the Six Nations, I'm really looking forward to France here and England here. You last know. game England before the World Cup. Last game England <laughs> before the World Cup. Wow, yeah, what a humdinger yeah. that'll be if, oh, if yeah. Ireland are unbeaten up to that stage and maybe England are unbeaten today. They had a good a good comeback against New Zealand, mm -hmm. you know, 21-3 down when I left the house <laughs> and then 25 all. That was a, a, a bookie's dream yeah, or nightmare. Yeah. But uh, look, I've really enjoyed it and, you know, the atmosphere has been fantastic and rugby is back and Ireland are number one and, you know, Happy days, Brent. Good Christmas. Thanks a million, Brent. <laughs> Thank Thanks <you>. again. <laughs>